things that I had to go through. I don't want to look into the face of the Lord and have him look at me and say, well, man, you did okay, but you didn't overcome. So you, you can, you, you'll be here for all eternity and you'll be saved, but you won't be wearing a crown. Not everybody in heaven will be wearing a crown. Amen. Don't fall into that trap that crowns come easily. You win them. You overcome. You prove yourself here in, in the here and now. And you gain them. Amen. 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 So we cast off a sin that so easily entangles and fouls our life up. And we run with perseverance. There's the third small point. We run it with perseverance. So the Christian life actually is not like a hundred meter sprint, like a same bolt one. It's actually more like a marathon race that we have to learn to endure and it lasts a long time and it goes on, amen? And a marathon race is much more difficult to run than a 100 meter sprint, amen? 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And it says here, similarly, if anybody competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. You don't get the victor's crown unless you compete according to the rules. Now you've seen, you've all seen in, 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 you know, in the athletics race when they're all kind of on your marks, get set, and they're waiting for the gun to go, but they start to run before the gun goes off. It's a false start. And the first time round, they let you off, so you start again, you try again. The second time, they'll let you off. But the third time, you actually get disqualified. You can no longer take part in the race, yeah? In the world of football, there are rules that govern the world of football. And uh, if you foul somebody, you'll, badly, badly enough, you break the rules of the game, you'll get a yellow card. But if you repeat it, you'll get a red card. A red card will send you away from the pitch and you're going to spend the rest of the game sitting on the sidelines watching and you won't be allowed to play for your team again for the next three games, as, as the rule is at the moment, yeah? There are rules in the Christian life. We have to compete according to the rules because if we don't, we won't receive the crown. I once knew somebody who professed faith in Christ and he will remain nameless. I won't say who the person is. But I knew the person's life well enough as a pastor, I got to know the person. And when I found out what was really going on in his life behind the scenes, I was shocked. Shocked. Because here he was professing faith in Christ. He was in church on a Sunday morning. And you wouldn't think there was anything going in his life. But the guy had a sin in his life from which he did not repent. He didn't deal with the sin that so easily entangled his own life. He did not cast off every hindrance, so he couldn't run his race properly. And I won't mention the details, but he was cautioned over something that was good officially, over something that was going on privately in his life. He was out there trying to run the race around the track in front of everybody else, but he wasn't in the gym. He wasn't dealing with things in his life. He wasn't in the swimming pool trying to strengthen his muscles. He wasn't competing according to the rules of the game in the spiritual world, amen? Number one, the number one rule in the spiritual life, if you really want to walk with God, really want to walk with God and be a success in your Christian life, then the first thing you have to learn to do is do away with sin. Do away with sin of any description in your life. Get rid of it, throw it away, chuck it in the garbage bin, Deal with it. Amen? Which means that sometimes you have to learn and agree to declare war on some things that are going on in your life. The biggest problem you will ever have is not somebody out there. It's not the person that, 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 that gets you angry or irritated from time to time. That's not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is your own nature which lies within yourself. And that's something you've got to learn to fight and to overcome every day for the rest of your life. And hear an amen. Because that is what will foul you up. That is what will hinder you. And that is what will stop you from running your race. Can I hear an amen? amen. I'm speaking straight. The older I get, the straighter I speak. Because you know, you, you know it's got to be said. Amen. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24 where I was before. And this is the main passage. Amen. 
This is the Apostle Paul speaking, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking about himself. Now, when you think about the Apostle Paul, if you know anything about the Bible, you'll know that the Apostle Paul was a great, powerful, respected, apostolic preacher of the Gospel, and he was responsible for taking the Gospel all the way from what is now Turkey, and for, sorry, from what is now Syria, through Turkey, into Greece and beyond. I mean, there are few people in the Christian world, in Christian history, that have served God the way Paul did. Paul did great things. He did fantastic things. So when you think of Paul, you have this kind of aura. You imagine him with a halo around his head, as it were, because you think, you know, it was fantastic that God could take somebody's life like that and use them so powerfully. But me, I could never be like that, and God could never use me like that. And God probably won't ever use you like that, okay? Because, you know, God has specific purposes for specific people. But look what Paul says about himself in chapter 9 and verse 26. I, Paul, do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I, Paul, beat my body. And I'll explain what that means later. I make my body, my own physical body, my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Amen? I want to win the race. I don't want to get the red car. I don't want to be disqualified from my crown. I don't want to be disqualified from the race. And in my case, that means being disqualified from ministry. Because I haven't, because after I preach to others, I'm not living the life. Amen? See, what the same Bob did in the gym, that's the bit you don't see. But it's what you are privately that determines what you can become publicly. You cannot win the race in the stadium. You cannot win on the football field if you're not there day in and day out and day in and day out doing monotonous, boring things which actually keep you fit. Amen? Usain Bolt's race in the sprint would only last for 10 seconds, and sometimes less than 10 seconds, he was that fast. 10 seconds, all concentrated effort to win the race in 10 seconds. That means that probably 99.99% of his time, he's not running races, because his races only last 10 seconds. Imagine it, how short it would, 10 seconds. I mean, you've got to get absolutely right, you know. Foul up in 10 seconds and you've lost, yeah? <clears throat> So 99% of his time is spent doing things which are boring, monotonous, that get on his nerves that he can't stop doing because he's done it repetitively for day after day and for week after week. And all of that training is also combined with special diets. Amen. He can't run his race, he can't win his prize if he doesn't diet his body properly, which means he's got to control what he eats and what he drinks. Can I hear them that? We all love these kind of sermons, don't we? Amen. Eat the right food, drink the right drink, and then you'll be in a fit enough state to win your race. Amen. How many of you know that people that are not fit can't really serve God? Now that's a tough thing to say. Amen. But it's true. Now, you can always serve God for as long as you've got a mouth, because you've always got a mouth that can share the gospel with people around you. You've got a mouth that can pray. Amen. But if you want to do the kind of work that I did as a missionary, you've got to be physically fit. You've got to be physically fit, otherwise you simply cannot do it. Amen? I had to keep myself physically fit for years. I fasted regularly every week. I had to spiritually and also to keep my body in tone. Amen? Keep yourself in tone. <clears throat> now, so we run so that we can win. The fitter you are, the more you can do. <clears throat> How many of you want to do more? I do. And because I've only got one life, that means I've got to be in control of this body. Yeah? I've got to discipline this body so that it doesn't discipline me. See, either I control my body or my body's desires, my body's lusts, my body's appetites control me. Either I make my body serve me to do what it should do, 
otherwise it controls me and makes me do things I shouldn't do. Amen? Can I hear amen? Don't get discouraged. I'm trying to hit something here that needs to be here, not to discourage, but to encourage and to exhort. Yeah? Because Paul says the same thing. I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will be disqualified from the prize. Amen? So, verse 25. Everyone who competes into the games goes into strict training. Goes into strict training. And that's what the same Bob did. Strict training so that when he's out there, he can win the race. Amen? Now, I'm going to read from this book. It's a book I absolutely love. It's a book called The Spirit of the Disciplined by a, a seminary professor called Dallas Willard, and he, he absolutely nails it. Now, I'm going to read this out because I can't think of any better way to communicate it, so I don't normally read from books. Think of certain young people who idolize an outstanding baseball player. They want nothing so much as to pitch or run or hit as well as their idol does. So what do they do? When they are playing in a baseball game, they all try to behave exactly as their favorite baseball star does. The star is well known for sliding headfirst into bases, so the teenagers do too. These young people try anything and everything their idol does, hoping to be like him. They buy, the type, they buy the type of shoes the star wears, the same glove he uses, the same bat. You recognize that? We've all been there, we've all done it, yeah? But will they succeed in performing like the star, though? We all know the answer quite well. We know that they won't succeed if all they do is try to be like him in the game they play. No matter how gifted they may be in their own way, and we all understand why. The star performer himself didn't achieve his excellence by trying to behave in a certain way only during the game. Instead, he chose an overall life of preparation of mind and body, pouring all his energies into that total preparation to provide a foundation in the body's automatic responses and, for, and strength for his conscious efforts during the game. Those exquisite responses we see, the amazing timing and strength such an athlete displays, aren't produced and maintained by the short hours of the game itself. They're available to the athlete for those short and all-important hours because of a daily regimen no one sees. For example, the proper diet, rest, and the exercise for specific muscles are not part of the game itself. But without them, the athlete certainly would not perform outstandingly. Some of these daily habits may even seem silly to us, but the successful athlete knows that these disciplines must be undertaken, and undertaken rightly, or all his natural talents and best efforts will go down in defeat to others who have disciplined themselves in preparation for game time. What we find here is true of any human endeavour capable of giving significance to our lives. We are touching upon a general principle of human life. It's true for the public speaker or the musician, the teacher or the surgeon. A successful performance at a moment of crisis rests largely and essentially upon the depths of a self wisely and rigorously prepared in the totality of its being, mind and body. Amen? A baseball player who expects to excel in the game without adequate exercise of his body is no more ridiculous than the Christian who hopes to be able to act in the manner of Christ when put to the test without the appropriate exercise in godly living. Amen? And in this truth lies the secret of the easy yoke of Christ. The secret involves living as Christ did in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. Following in his steps cannot be equated with behaving as he did when he was on the spot. To live as Christ lived is to live as he did all his life. Our mistake is to think that following Jesus consists of loving our enemies, going the second mile, turning the other cheek, suffering patiently and hopefully, while living the rest of our lives just as everyone around us does. 
This is like the aspiring young baseball players mentioned earlier. It's a strategy bound to fail and to make the way of Christ difficult and left untried. In truth, it is not the way of Christ any more than striving to act in a certain manner in the heat of the game is the way of the champion athlete. Amen? In other words, in other words, you will never be able to live the Christian life as you should without learning to discipline yourself as Usain Bolt would. Yet in the Christian life they call spiritual disciplines. You have to learn to practice spiritual disciplines. Without those, your life will never be what God intended it to be. Amen? For instance, you will never really be able to trust God when the chips are down and you're in a difficult situation and you're right up against some real practical tests in your life of whatever nature if in daily life you haven't learned to trust God in the small things of daily living, amen? If you cannot, if you cannot learn to trust God with the smaller things around your home and your family, then when the big time of test comes, you won't stand. You will go under. Let's take another example. When somebody offends you or says something which really hurts you and the bitterness and the resentment really begin to settle into your life and kick in, and it's something that's really strong and really bad that, you know, you, we don't experience those too often, but sometimes we do from time to time. In that kind of a situation, you'll never stand and you'll be, you will succumb like many people do. You will succumb to bitterness and you'll never be able to get over it because in daily living, you've never learned to deal with the daily small and niggly things of daily life that you need to overcome daily and to forgive small things. In other words, if you don't learn to forgive small things, you'll never be able to give, forgive the big things. It's much, much, much harder. Amen? Amen? If you don't seek God in daily life, if you don't read your Bible daily, if you don't pray daily, if you don't worship God daily, if you don't spend time with God daily, no matter how long or short that time may be, if you don't do that on a daily basis and really train up your own personal spiritual life, then again, when the test comes, when the difficult times come, when the day of big temptation comes your way, then you won't be able to stand because you won't have the muscle, the spiritual muscle, to be able to stand. Amen? Now, saying Bolt can't run that race without dealing with his quad muscles. Here, he's got to have, I mean, you go to the gym, you know what I mean? We've got a couple of people here that go to the gym. You've got to, you, you've got to be in the spiritual gym. You know, testing your quad muscles and, and building yourself up. And the way you do that, the, the initial way you do that in the Christian life is by learning to spend time with God. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to get the Bible in you. You've got to learn to pray. You've got to learn to pray in the Holy Spirit. You've got to learn to stand on your own two feet. Amen? Amen? If you don't determine to trust God and what we've got in the small things of daily life, then when the big things come your way, as they inevitably do from time to time, you won't stand. Don't dream, you won't. It's like the teenage fan of baseball trying to pretend he wants to be like his hero, but the reason why he never becomes like his hero is because he never undergoes that daily regimentation of self-discipline that prepares his hero to play the game. Amen? 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 So you will never succeed before other people unless you can succeed when you're on your own. It is what you are when you're on your own in your own home and nobody's looking at you. It's what you are then that determines what you will be before others. Amen. Thank you and amen. Christianity is not about, not, it's not about beings trying to be something in front of other people. It's about what you are yourself when you're alone with God because that's where it begins. That's where the rub is. That's where it's got to work. Amen. Amen. If you don't deal with small sins, niggly sins, what we call secret sins, the small... See, when I was at Bible school, I started Bible school, and we had to do these chores every day, and we didn't like them, you know. We used to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning to do an hour of chores before breakfast. Do you think we like doing that? No, but they said it's good missionary training, and most of us are going to be good missionaries one day somewhere in the world, so you have to learn to get out of bed early in the morning, and you have to learn to do a lot of things that you may not otherwise like to do. Amen? Amen? One of the things we had to do was 
peel the potatoes. It was the guys that peeled the potatoes, not the girls. The girls did the cleaning, the boys had to peel the potatoes. So every morning we had a we had a, a bucket full, a big bucket full of potatoes that we had to peel. And I remember I was in the potato peeling house with Joe, Big Joe. We had a student called Big Joe from Bristol. And, uh, and it was about kind of my first week, of, of first couple of weeks of Bible school, and then we are swimming away trying to peel these potatoes. And he puts his he puts his hand in this in this bucket, trying to see most of the he, he, we peeled most of the potatoes, we put them back into the same bucket, but there were still a few unpeeled potatoes right down at the bottom. So he reaches the stage where he's kind of scrummaging around trying to find you know, the, the, the odd unpeeled potato at the bottom of the bucket trying to cook it out. And he looks at me and he says, where are you, secret sin? Let me put you out. <laughs> so that's a great illustration. That's a great way to put yeah, it, yeah. yeah? It's the secret sin. It's the little sin. Yeah. It's the little thing that you keep on doing. It's the little thing that you allow yourself to do that you don't get victory over. That's the very thing that will spoil your life. That is what will put you down. And a lot of people don't get it. A lot of people don't get it. They think they can get away with, with, with you know, and they can successfully walk with Christ while at the same time at home, in the privacy of their own home, they're allowing and tolerating little things which they know are not right. Amen. Can I make the point? And it can affect anybody, young or old, male or female, anybody, and it can happen at any stage of your life. I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this, you know what the age is where people begin to compromise more? It's when they get older. It's not when they're younger, it's when they get older because they begin to slacken away, you know, they begin to, well I've walked my life, I've done that time, you know, so I can slacken off a bit. You can't afford to slacken off a bit. Have you ever seen an athlete where that's, that's winning the race and they're approaching the finishing line and they begin to slacken off? What happens? The guy that's in the silver medal position begins to catch up with him and sometimes he overtakes him. He gets the crown. And it wasn't his, 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 his great running that did it. It was the fact that the guy, the guy that was in the first position slacked off. Amen. Don't slack up. Deal with sin. I've got a great quote. I found this on Facebook yesterday. I thought I must read this out. Again, I'm reading, okay? People do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture faith and delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise and we call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience and we call it freedom. We cherish the indiscipline of lost control and we call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and we delude ourselves into thinking that we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and we convince ourselves we have been liberated. There. That sums it up, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Paul said, no. I want my crown, says Paul. I want it. And I'm going for it. And I'm going for the gold medal position. I want to win my race. I want to finish my race. You know when I was at seminary, we had one of the greatest professors of leadership in the world, a guy by the name of Bobby Clinton, world famous, wrote some really, really good books. And one of his major mantras was finish well, finish well. And he likened the Christian life to a chess game. And then a chess game, if you've ever played it, there are three distinct phases in a game of chess. The beginning, the beginning game, the middle game, and the end game. And most people lose a game of chess, not at the end. They lose a game of chess because of what happened in the middle game. That's where they made their strategic mistakes, which determined that the other person would eventually win the game. 
Some people, it's like me, you make the mistake in the beginning game and you never catch up. And you know you're, you know you're going to get tranced, you know, and that, that's what usually happens to me. Yeah? Finish well. Finish well. Don't give up. Don't compromise. Don't let go. Determine to deal with sin. Determine to deal with niggly things in your daily life. Don't let them, don't let them ride. Don't let them carry on. Paul uses a strong word here in verse 27. I beat my body. And some people have taken that the wrong way historically and started to actually whip themselves and beat their body physically. He's using figurative language. He doesn't want you to beat your body any more than, you know, he, he would himself. He didn't do it. He means it figuratively. It means I really get my body under control. That's what he means. And the Greek word that he used there actually means to punch somebody in the eye. Literally, to punch somebody in the eye. Give a black eye. That's what it means. Yeah? So one of the translations actually translate this, translates this as, I beat myself black and blue. <laughs> That's the way they translate it, to try to bring out the meaning. Yeah? Now, we're not going to beat each other black and blue. We're going to do that to ourselves. Okay? But it talks about the strength of willingness and determination to become a winner. And that's the strength of language you've got to use with yourself. See you're saying, Bob, I imagine myself doing that. And I imagine myself giving up after half an hour. Covered in sweat, absolutely exhausted, every muscle in my body aching like crazy. You know, one we when, when, when I was uh, younger, in my early 20s, I, I, I used to work in my summers. In